At the time of this incident, it was 2005 and I was about 10 years old. I lived in a small village in Scotland with my family and our dog. It was a lovely little village and I consider it to be my home to this day. The people there were really nice, but everyone knew everyone else's business, which is not always a good thing. Anyway, I was a part of the brownies, the young version of guides. I had been a part of it for a few months and had already achieved a few badges, stargazing, friends to animals, sports, etc. It was really good fun and a place where I could enjoy the company of my friends. The school we all went to had 60 kids at the most, so everyone really knew and got along with everyone else. I had been given a letter telling me that there was going to be a camp in a few weeks on the grounds of our local village hall with the brownies. Being 10 years old, I jumped at that chance and was begging my parents to let me go, and they did. The camp took place over two nights, and from what I remember, I think it was in the summer, not long after my grandfather passed away. I had missed a sleepover with my best friend Georgia, as we found out about my grandfather's passing only a few hours before me and my sister were supposed to stay over, so this camp I suppose made up for that. So I went to the camp excited and not knowing what sort of fun things we'd get up to. We did a lot of fun activities, like learning different types of knots, making kites, and learning really how to camp so we could all get our camping badges. We learned how to air out our tents and basic survival skills, which I was really into. The hall was just across from the road where me and my family used to walk our black lab, and you could see the tents up from the road. It was quite a small ground where the tents were pitched, but it was enough for our tents and the guides' tents. We were all sorted into groups and given our tents. The first night was quite a night. I remember it was raining heavily because our tents were only made of canvas. The rain seeped through really easily. I shared a tent with my sister, Alexandra, and a few other friends. Nine-year-olds Billy Jean and Georgia, who wiped up water puddles with my jacket, me and my sister and Georgia were all massive Harry Potter fans, and because our tent had a green flag on it, we called it the Slytherin tent. It was a tight squeeze, but we did alright. We all had lanterns on as it got dark and began to tell each other scary stories. At one point, Georgia snuck out to the toilets inside and decided to put cling wrap on the toilet. It was hilarious. She has always been a funny person. She came back and me and my campmates chatted until about midnight, as the pattering of the rain would have kept us up anyway. It must have been about 1am when we eventually fell asleep. I can't remember what time it was, but I awoke to a strange scratching noise on the tent canvas. I thought it was maybe just an animal, because the village was quite in a rural area and was about 10 miles away from the nearest town. My sister tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I was awake. Everyone in the tent was. I was frightened, but not as frightened as Billie Jean, who got freaked out really easily at anything. We all tried to be quiet as we heard the rustling on the grass outside. I saw the shadow of a human figure move across the side of our tent. Me and Georgia, being the tomboys and the bravest of us, unzipped the tent flap and looked outside to see who was there. The rain was blowing wildly into our faces, and the field was practically flooding in parts. There was nobody there. We went back inside the tent and told the other girls that there was nothing to worry about and we should just go back to sleep. So that's what we all did. Well, we tried to anyways. The story doesn't end there. I awoke about 4 in the morning to a young girl screaming frantically outside. Georgia recognized it immediately to be her 7 year old sister Olivia. She sprinted out of the tent so quickly, I barely knew what was going on. Myself, Alexandra, and Billie Jean looked out of the tent and just saw loads of girls running out wildly in the heavy rain and talking loudly amongst themselves, almost panicking. Olivia was talking to Georgia, only wearing her pajamas and nothing on her feet. All we heard was people complaining about how flooded the field was becoming and some mumbling that I couldn't make out. I had no idea what was going on. Georgia came back swiftly and said that Olivia had been freaked out by a shadowy figure laughing and scratching at the tent she was in with her friend Billie Jean's sister. Everyone freaked out. The leader of our brownies group, Georgia's mom, 
Stephanie, came out and told everyone not to worry and get back to sleep. So that's what we try to do. Olivia and Ava spent the rest of the night in our leader's tents as they both been reduced to tears after their terrifying experience. Morning soon came and the sun rose. The rain had thankfully stopped, but Billie Jean laid awake all night. Whatever was creeping outside our tent really freaked her out. The camp leaders called an emergency meeting at 8 a.m. after breakfast and we all settled into the hall. Stephanie told us that she had been given several reports of one or two people scratching on the tents and making scary noises outside the other people's tents and she wanted whoever it was to own up. Everyone just looked at each other blankly. None of us did it. Georgia didn't stay the final day of the camp because she was ill and looked as pale as a ghost. Billie Jean just kept saying she wanted to go home, but her mom was one of the leaders, so she couldn't. I enjoyed the rest of the camp, making Harry Potter quizzes and generally having a great time with my friends, but the second night we went to bed and the same thing happened. We were convinced that this was just some stupid prank someone was playing on us. But some people said that it was this girl, Darcy, and her friend Tommy who wanted to scare all the campers. But they were 11 and 10 at the time, so I wasn't convinced that they managed to leave their houses at 4 in the morning without waking up their parents. When everyone speculated that it was them, we all confronted them numerous times, but they insisted that it wasn't. Other people said that it was probably a ghost, which of course was complete nonsense. Our house was located about two minutes away from the hall, and before it was built, it was a prisoner of war camp during World War II that covered the whole village. Some people say that there are ghosts of lost soldiers there, but of course, I think all the kids love a good ghost story and would believe anything that they were told. I finished the camp and got my badge. It was a great experience if not a little bit creepy. I never found out who or what it was creeping around our tents at camp, but I guess I'll never know. My boyfriend and I are a young couple in our mid-college years. We decided that we wanted to get away from work and our studies for the weekend, so we took a trip to the nearest hiking trail that is a part of the Appalachian Trail. We decided to leave on a Friday once we got off work and backpack up the trail in order to camp there over the weekend. I work in a restaurant and it's very difficult to have a set time of when I'm going to leave work. I ended up leaving work around 4 o'clock, but we said that no matter what, we were going to go on this trip. We finally left for the trail and began hiking around 5.30. My boyfriend was an Eagle Scout, so we had all the necessary supplies for a successful camping trip. Tent, sleeping bags, sleeping pads, pots, pans, clothes, food. The first part of our hike was absolutely exhausting. It was all uphill, and we were both carrying at least 40 pounds in our metal frame backpacks. An hour later, we finally passed the first shelter. If many of you don't know, a shelter on this trail is about 10 foot by 15 foot log cabin that has three walls and is open to the outside. It's specifically used as a shelter to sleep in or hide from the rain. Midway through the hike, it began to pour dramatically in the forest. Sooner or later, we both were soaked from head to toe. The thick fog grew quickly as it had been a hot and humid Friday. The trail became very slippery and our pace slowed down tremendously. We had hoped that we were getting closer to the camping site, but it turned dark very, very quickly. We took a rest in the dark as the rain poured on us in hopes to find our headlamps. Once we found our headlamps, we placed them on our heads, still struggling to balance ourselves on top of the rocky, muddy path. I thought by that point, we would never make it to our shelter. We walked, never giving up, although I wanted to. As my socks and shoes were wet, I was tired, hungry, drenched, and cold. The temperature had dropped more than 25 degrees as we made our way up. It was around 8.30 when we finally made it through the second shelter to the campgrounds. There was a split in the path. Either you could walk straight to continue onto the top of the view, 
which is about another mile and a half away. You could turn slightly to the right and walk to the campgrounds, or you could take a 90 degree turn to the right and walk down to the shelter. At that point, we were drenched from head to toe and needed to dry off. It was still raining, so it would have been nearly impossible to set up our tent and camp. We had decided that we would stay put in the shelter until the rain calmed down. We didn't hear anyone at the shelter, so I was extremely excited to have the place to ourselves and take a few hits off of something, if you know what I mean. After our hike, I was dead set on it. Once we walked down to the shelter and got to the opening, there was a man and woman in their 60s. We instantly thought to ourselves that they were an older married couple who wanted to get away for the weekend too. We told them that we wouldn't be bothering them for long, so we let our backpacks down and attempt to dry off. The couple was very welcoming with a lantern and also an absorbing towel for me to dry off on. My boyfriend and I both took off our shirts since they were both carrying a lot of water weight. The couple seemed to be pretty normal and the man brought a cute dog with him that I enjoyed playing with. We began introducing ourselves with our names, where we were from, and what we were doing there. They both said they were in their 60s. Their names were Joe and Maya, and that they were just messing around for the weekend. They were taking large gulps of what looked like to be alcohol in their water pack. They said they were just having fun and met online, which veered off into dropping hints that they were there on the trail having an affair. The older woman, who said that she was from West Virginia, strike me to be very off. It began with her looks, having a scraggly, shoulder-length gray hair with circular glasses resting on her face. Her teeth were very dark, nearly covered with brown film, as if she had used hard drugs in the past. She wore a pullover, hiking boots, and jean shorts that nearly exposed everything. Joe, on the other hand, was just an average white male who had gray hair and was a tad overweight. They spoke about their past employments and what they had done in life. Maya said that she was a writer, which I admired. Information about ourselves was highly exchanged too, since they seemed to be very friendly. I was in a very bad mood though, and was very irritable until I smoked some. My boyfriend and I periodically showed each other our phones in order to communicate. As we didn't have a bit of service in the shelter that we were staying at, we agreed that it was okay if we started smoking, since they were becoming drunk. They said they didn't mind, but would like to join in. I thought it was absolutely insane that they wanted to smoke too at that age. The man only took two hits, but the woman took too many. As she was struggling a lot to even flick the lighter, the guys began their own conversation, and the woman and I veered off in our own as well. The woman began asking me to tell her a story as she inched closer and closer to me. She asked me to tell her a story and she grew more and more demanding, saying, tell me a story. My boyfriend and I met online just as they said they did, so I was going to tell her a story about how we met. I begin the story with, so you met him online, right? The woman nearly cuts me off and angrily says, what? Why would you say that? I said to her, you met online, right? She nearly cuts me off again and more aggressively says, what? Why would you say that? I said again, I said again, earlier, Joe said you all met online, didn't you? Then she nearly shouts and growls, why would you say that? I wanted to jump up away from that conversation so quickly, so I asked her, well you were a writer you said, right? So why don't you tell me one of your best stories? The woman becomes happy and giggly. And while swirling her hands around her head in the air, she said, well, I'm a writer in my mind. I was extremely confused and creeped out. I didn't know what to say. I'm the type of person to laugh it off, so that's what I did. She just said that she enjoyed being a writer in her own mind. I look over at my boyfriend's and Joe's conversation, and it seemed to be normal as can be. There was absolutely nothing wrong about it, but Maya nearly gave me chills as she got my attention, getting closer into my face, asking me what I was saying. The problem was that I wasn't saying anything. I was absolutely silent, ignoring her. She began talking to herself. She would make very in-depth hand gestures as she spoke to herself, and she would wonder what I was telling her. 
She abruptly say, yes, no, maybe, yeah, I can't, wait, huh? As she would rock back and forth waving her arms around, she began crossing her legs, holding her arms up in the air above her head. She started to shout, come out, I'm calling out all of you, come. She was nearly talking gibberish. The older man's attention was caught and he asked her what in the world she was doing. She said, I'm calling out. It's witchcraft. I was nearly high and terrified of all my surroundings. It stormed loudly in the background and was pitch black all around us. A small lamplight rested on the beam above our heads in the middle of the wooden shelter. I was wet and very vulnerable. Everything slowly began to get worse that night. Maya kept slurring her words and the man demanded that she get in her sleeping bag and sleep. I sat against the wall next to my boyfriend very closely as the man crawled into his sleeping bag and Maya attempted to put her legs in the sleeping bag but couldn't. She moved around for a very long time and finally curled up next to Joe on top of her sleeping bag. She was probably freezing as it was 35 degrees by 9.30. Only a few minutes passed and we heard Maya whisper, What did you give to me? She growls again. What did you give to me? The man finally woke up and demanded, What? Maya hits him on his back and yells, What did you give to me? She jumps up immediately, facing us. Her eyes were nearly all black, as her pupils were so enlarged. She looked nearly sadistic and yelled at us, What did he give me? My boyfriend and I both tensed up, nearly losing it. She screams again, What did he give me? Even louder again as her voice screeched into my eardrums. She once again turned around to the man, lying down behind him. She slowly whispered into his ear, softly growling, did you give me acid? It began to run through my mind that he had drugged her, or she was having a flashback of a bad trip. Joe attempted to calm her down, but she was still restless. She laid down for approximately five minutes, but Maya immediately sat up. She faced us with her legs crossed, she stared at us without breaking contact for at least five minutes. She did this every so often, sitting up and staring at us, then laying back down. She would do this over and over again, so we decided to leave immediately. We finally made our way out as she stared at us for one last time. We pitched camp as far away as possible, but I remained sleepless that night in fear Maya would find our tent and crawl into it. I'm a university student now, but this incident happened when I was in the 8th grade. When I was around 14, I studied a subject focusing on outdoor pursuits. For our final assessment, two teachers took my class on a one night camp where we would go do activities like rock climbing, kayaking, trail walking, and a few other things. I live in Australia, around an hour from a state forest that was notorious for backpack murders. Several bodies have been found and several more remain missing. I'm pretty sure all the murders were linked to the same serial killer. Anyway, in the morning, we leave the school and drive out in a bus. We reach the road that leads to the entrance of the forest. A police car is parked to the side. He spoke to the teacher for a moment, but I didn't hear anything, and no one else seemed to notice or care. Fast forward a few hours, and we've trekked, about 20 of us, to the camping area somewhere in the middle of the state forest. While kayaking that afternoon, we noticed a helicopter doing flybys, but again my classmates never suspected anything. A couple of friends and I were first to leave the water and help the teacher with some equipment and started to build our own rafts. I was standing off to the side when one of the national park guides walked over to one of the instructors and talked in a hushed, slightly stressed out tone I remember hearing the instructor say stuff like, You're kidding. I don't believe that. He just looked shocked and taken back. So at this point I started connecting the dots, but I didn't say anything to my school friends. Around dusk that night, I go to use the toilet block, which is around 100 meters from the main campsite. As I go in, I remember a guy walking around the other side of the block. I didn't see him very clearly in the diminished light but he kept glancing around with nervous body language. 
I couldn't see his face clearly. He wasn't part of our party, and to me, he just didn't fit. I didn't think much of it at the time. Fast forward the next morning when we get back to our car where we parked. The teacher tells us that a body was found in a dam not far from where we were. They didn't want to tell us earlier because they thought it would frighten us. We later found out that it was a young guy who was killed with an axe, and the guy who did it was related to the serial killer who hunted in the same area. I don't know if the guy I saw had anything to do with the murders, but it freaked me out afterwards, and I haven't been camping since.